Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's the second session. We are fully prepared to discuss uh, what are challenges to the Baltic states uh, at the uh, borders of different countries, what is our neighborhood. And uh, yesterday I was asked, is there something unique uh, in the Riga conference this year in comparison with previous uh, conferences? And I said, yes, there is a quite unique uh, debate. And this debate is organized among uh, chairmen of foreign affairs committees of parliaments of uh, three Baltic states. Uh, we have here uh, our guests from Estonia, Marko Michelson, chairman of uh, Estonian parliament. We have with us uh, Zygmantas Pavilionis from Lithuanian parliament. And also a uh, representative uh, from Latvia is Richard Scholz. Uh, and we are going to discuss diverse issues related to the Baltic cooperation. But before we start our conversation, I again would like to remind that we already yesterday paid our tribute to Oyar Serik Skalnic, but he was also a long-standing chairman of Foreign Affairs Committee of Parliament of Latvia, and he fulfilled very many duties, including uh, participation in the Baltic Assembly, NATO Parliamentary Assembly, and he was very decisive personality in uh, implementing Latvian foreign and also security policy. So I invite again to remember Oyars and join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, ready to start. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the uh, Baltic cooperation is one of those models which very often is mentioned as a very successful one. Uh, and indeed, if we look into our history, there have been a lot of unique examples we can be proud of, and they are very often even mentioned and as example of commitment of three nations despite whatever size of a neighbor is to achieve goals what nation really defined. At the same time, if we're looking into histories, there are enough also uh, points where we disagreed or had certain troubles among ourselves, which is just a normality in democratic society. So you cannot all countries think alike. And in order to kick off our discussion, I would like to ask each of you, from your point of view, in last couple of years, what was the biggest achievement in the Baltic cooperation? And which were critical issues where probably potential of cooperation was not fully utilized? Uh, Mr. Coles, I would like to start with you. So yeah, you are far away from me. <laughs> uh, well, a couple of years. Uh... I think the, the success is really the ongoing cooperation that is very much deepened uh, since we regain our independence. Um, that, you know, the healthy rivalry that we had up until 2004 was really appreciative, uh, particularly uh, going, giving this positive push, who will be the first, and then and having this uh, very good dynamics that resulted with all three Baltic countries becoming EU members and NATO. Um, in in last decade or so, uh, we see that as we are maturing democracies, um, we start to identify our stance in international community um, as a single countries as well and as a region. And of course, certain uh, uh, aspects start to be different viewed be it from Latvia's point of view, be it from Estonia's or Lithuania's. And I think the, um, I mean, there, there's, I would say all the time there is a positive di uh, dynamics when it comes to Baltic cooperation, be it uh, foreign affairs, be it security or defense. But of course, uh, you know, the, the little things do matter where sometimes we have a discord. And I think uh, what, where we haven't managed to really grasp the, the cooperation that we had so far is actually addressing the energy security. Uh, that is something that I think has challenged the, the, the Baltic region and is still a challenge for us. And there are internal divisions 
among the Baltic countries, what is the best way to proceed, to approach. And I think uh, in, in that regard, uh, I would expose this kind of you know, um, shortcomings from, from the cooperation. Thank you, Mr. Kols. Mr. Pavilionis, what would be your positive and critical points? Well, to say it bluntly, I think everything we did and everything we are doing now, it's perfect. Because tell me and name me the region that transformed so well from the Soviet zoo, from occupied you know, ground zero to the level we have today. Even compare us with any country that acceded to the UN NATO at the same time. So broadly saying, we are the most inspiring example of transform transformation. Uh, actually, those are the words of President Obama that he told me when I was ambassador there. You are the most inspiring example of transformation of 21st century. He was using it. Uh, but I would say, looking to shortcomings, uh, I would say they are related exactly uh, with the future. We need to learn how to be really the best of the best. It means tackling the challenges of the future together, thinking together, strategizing together. And already this format, honestly, I think this is really the most intensive parliamentary regional format you have in EU 27. Nobody meets like us, I don't know, six, well, at the end of this month, it will be eighth meeting from April after pandemia. We plan every day, we do statements, we act together. But I would say tackling the future, and here will come to sensitive area China because that's the future struggle between autocracies and democracies, between uh, you know, societies controlled by autocracies and rule of law and democracies and innovations and technology, who will control it? Freedom, uh, democracy-based nations, or those who enslave the people. And I think we should take the lead on that, in that future contest. And that's not only political choice for democracy, that's a geopolitical choice with whom we stand, and also economic choice, to be honest. We need to be with the most innovative, technologically advanced countries. We need to inspire the region. Why? Because we need to change the regi region around us, including Europe whole and free, from Belarus to EU and NATO enlargement to the east, uh, you know, Lithuanian presidency in EU 27, Latvian 28, before we have Czechs, Swedes, Poles. Let's coordinate together and enlarge the club. And, but for this, you need to be the best on a global future level to attract US, to attract biggest capitals to you, to get their power, and then make the things you want. Yeah, I definitely agree with your position on uh, necessity to address issues which are relevant for future and build future together. But I think that this will be a big challenge for you parliamentarians, because at the present moment, people are so concerned about present day's troubles and a very, very inspiring leadership is needed to look a little bit behind where we are now. And indeed, this is the role of politicians, which you could definitely uh, play. And now I would like to ask Mr. Michelson, so what would be your take on achievements and also critical points? Yeah, very good morning uh, for me as well. It's good to be among friends, actually. Last night we uh, had a good dinner here in Riga together, and uh, this was, what, sixth meeting of this year. It shows how close we are, actually. And uh, me has, has been, uh, I have been 20 years in Estonian parliament now, and I've never seen such kind of vibrancy and uh, the good connection between okay. free capitals and all levels. So it's, we are very good friends. We call each other free Baltic musketeers. <laughs> actually, we have traveled only this year in Ukraine. We were on front line on, uh, in April. We were in Berlin. We were just two weeks ago in, uh, in Paris. And then in two weeks' time, we will go together again to Moldova. Please name 
those free countries of NATO or, or EU who are working so closely together, even on our level as we, we, we speak here, but we know that prime ministers, speakers, presidents work uh, in the same way. And actually, as a historian, I could go back uh, to uh, 1930s and pre-World War II time when we actually we made very tragic mistakes. We didn't listen to each other. We didn't understand the world around us. And actually, this was sort of and the tragedy. What happened after that during World War II uh, gave us to to three of us uh, enormous lesson. So the, I, I think we think similarly in Tallinn, Vilnius, and Riga that never again alone. We have to cooperate. We have, we have the, the challenges. Who, what we see on our borders actually existing all the time, and they are not uh, fading away, and this is why we have to be awake, and, uh, and as you said, we have to kind of create strong leadership to see and to look beyond the corner, and this is what uh, Shigimanta said is important, but also we have to keep our eyes open what, uh, what's happening on our, on our borders, and this is why most efficiency is what we have in, in, in cooperation. But perhaps sometimes it's, uh, come, uh, they come down to the personal level as well. Maybe the chemistries are not sometimes uh, working well, but, uh, but uh, the understanding that we have to build connectivity, better con connectivity between each of us, and also energy security, as you mentioned, this is something what we don't, we don't have just an alternative rather than to link up with uh, the European electricity grid and also to, to look beyond uh, Sort of uh, begin uh, we uh, inside of the, the, the major change in, uh, in energy uh, shift. Anyway, we have to look for new solutions, and this is where we free can work easily together. Thank you, thank you for optimism and also joining this leadership point, which definitely will be needed. Uh, I would like also ask a question about one of our not very far neighbors. However, it could sound very far away. Uh, it's China. Uh, there is only one country between China and three Baltic states, as you all know, Russia. So anyway, almost neighbor. Uh, and um, the question about uh, European Chinese and uh, Baltic Chinese relations uh, has been appearing on agenda with a certain frequency. And yesterday, also prime ministers of Latvia and Lithuania mentioned that the model how to cooperate with China is 27 plus 1. Uh, before, we were very aware of 17 plus 1. And uh, Lithuania uh, stated that uh, it was drawing from this format. My question is uh, whether there were consultations uh, among chairs of the Foreign Affairs Committee on this step, or how this decision was made and what impact it left on, on, on uh, neighboring Baltic countries. Mr. Pavilionis, how it happened? Please tell. Well, uh, well, first of all, maybe you also noticed that we made a joint statement uh, on those issues, uh, actually calling for unity, uh, as on all other issues. Uh, 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 few threats to our security or unity, we are uh, trying uh, to create that EU 27 plus 1. We've been lobbying for it in Paris. French will have their own presidency. Uh, German presidency tried to do it, but it didn't happen because of pandemia, some other reasons. But actually, those, this is one of the ideas that unites Europeans the most. And not only Europeans, Americans, our friends from UK, the whole democratic world is searching for the way to dialogue with autocratic country that is trying to change the rules of the game and an international scene that we don't want to change. We want everybody to behave the same, you know, applying the same standards and in international law and so on. So I am, I'm quite sure of our consultations in, in Paris that during French presidency this format will be created, but not only format, some instruments that are called anti-coercion mechanism 
So if China today is attacking little small Lithuania and it thinks to do it tomorrow with Czech Republic or Estonia, you know, EU is retaliating at the same way China is doing it uh, with us. And I think we will discuss it during French presidency, but we will also discuss it at Democracy Summit in Washington, D.C. In Vilnius, we will try to make some preparatory meeting for this. Uh, together, uh, also at the Chia's uh, or foreign affairs uh, level. So I'm quite sure that we will be able to achieve that result. And on Taiwan, that is a hidden uh, element of this, you know, just read carefully the EU Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. Every country is invited to develop as deep as possible economic relations with Taiwan. When I was in Taiwan three years ago, I was shocked with one simple fact. All, most of EU member states have economic representations there. We, you know, the champions of successful transformation, the most innovative in, uh, da, 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 economies in the world, we don't have them. And this is a market, one of the most innovative markets in this region, uh, and we have to do it. And that's why actually following Estonian example, we are now opening representations in those spots of best, you know, technologically innovative development like Singapore, South Korea, Australia, because that's the, the world we, we belong to. Mr. Mikkelson, uh, what is your stand on uh, uh, situation uh, related to China and also those positive examples which your colleague mentioned uh, in the Pacific region? Yeah, this is an uh, enormously huge topic, actually. We can go and <laughs> stay with China for the for rest of our d debate. But I, I'm ask, I, I very much agree with uh, Jigge Montes uh, that we have to pay much more attention and think strategically. Think about what kind of future we will have and what kind of role China, uh, do we want it or not, will play in this uh, world. Today, even today, the, the previous uh, debate was about uh, data sharing and uh, AI and quantum computing and so. It's, we, we as Europeans, not only here as uh, the representatives of free Baltic states, we must be very worried. Uh, we already, we can, we have difficulties to handle Huawei, we have difficulties to handle 5G uh, topic because China is there and playing a major role already. And of course, I agree with you that China's uh, uh, as more and more assertive foreign policy is, uh, is directed to uh, uh, either to rewrite uh, some rules in international politics on the world order or uh, to uh, defend their own sort of vision about human rights and uh, universal, universal rights like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you handle? We, Lithuania alone or Estonia alone or Latvia alone, you know, excuse me, a thousand times smaller in, uh, uh, than uh, China, we can put flags up and say, yeah, let's pay attention to this and that. But the only way, how do we build really workable uh, alternative or kind of uh, when we try to balance somehow a uh, growing uh, influence of uh, China in world politics is to work very closely together, not only in EU, but also uh, to strengthen transatlantic uh, cooperation. We, 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 are, we, we are a little bit worried about that there are, there are kind of, uh, uh, not, not, I'm not saying division lines, but at least the question about the trust between uh, major allies and after AUKUS, after Afghanistan, after some, you know, even in Eastern Europe, we see that there are different views on, on China. And we think about Hungary or Poland or some other places. So, our job today as politicians, but also for, for our diplomats, to, to really pay attention to this. How do we can manage, actually, to get to that point that we have common strategy on, on China, common f sort of vision. What China knows perfectly what, uh, what is their goal for year two, to 2049. Uh, do we know? Yes, this is great that the EU has no own strategy, but I, I, I think that it is enormously important to start seriously to talk between Europe and, and America as well about the new technologies and how to 
to, to create sort of common uh, ground for standardization in AI and quantum computing and so on and so forth. In this regard, coordination. Coordination is, a, is a something what, what we really have to pay attention between uh, three of us uh, prior to make kind of uh, loud decision about uh, in one and another direction. If you ask me about 16 plus one, I don't think that this format uh, works anymore uh, in a way ha as it was planned or hoped uh, 10 years ago. I think we have to, as European nations, to work on that, that how to build common EU approach to, to China. So, you know, let's get closer to our part of the world. <laughs> and I wanted to, to ask uh, Mr. Coles, uh, we have neighbors uh, which we are paying attention very closely to because of uh, different events going on there. And uh, one of the countries which I think all three Baltic states have uh, contributed and still are contributing is Ukraine. And Ukraine belongs to so-called trio countries, which are very much striving for EU and also NATO membership. To what extent uh, reforms in Ukraine constitute part of the Baltic Foreign Affairs Committee agenda? So, Mr. Cole, please. Well, Ukraine has been from day on, uh, first day on, when the Eastern Partnership was set as a priority to the Baltic countries and particularly after 2014 events and the, uh, uh, the you know, tr transformation of Ukraine towards the uh, Western integration in, in institutions, be it EU or NATO. Um, at the committee level, the engagement is very active. And I mean, um, again, for, for Ukraine, it has to do its own homework, but we are there to assist. Uh, to consult, be it also at the expert level, professional level, be it at the parliamentarians levels as well. The uh, very constant uh, uh, parliamentary diplomacy engagement uh, is there. As, I, uh, as Marco mentioned, uh, I think we were the first to travel to, uh, not only to Kiev, which is you know, constantly receiving international guests, but went straight to the Eastern Front, the front lines, um, uh, and that happened just weeks, no, like two weeks after the major military exercises at the Ukrainian border. So this is something where uh, Ukraine needs to feel support, not only from outside, but from within, in, in person. Um, so therefore, in, in that regard, uh, of course, we are closely following what is uh, being done uh, when it comes to rule of law, um, uh, land reform, judiciary system reform. Uh, but again, that is uh, the homework that has to be done only by uh, Ukrainians. Uh, of course, we will be vocal uh, when it comes to uh, the ongoing um, occupation of Crimean Peninsula. Uh, Ukraine has established, and that, that was actually the idea that was coming from the European uh, capitals to actually make the format which can last as long as it's necessary to address the um, all the atrocities that the occupation forces are conducting in occupied territories. Uh, just recent one, um, Russian Duma elections. The, uh, the politicians being elected into Russian Duma from Crimean Peninsula. This is something where the Western countries need to use this uh, formats, uh, not only to address, but to fight to not let these individuals, politicians, being present at the international organizations. Um, so overall, of course, we look forward to, uh, to have the Eastern Partnership Summit and, of course, the declaration. I think that is, uh, everybody is waiting. It still hasn't been drafted. Um, so um, my, the main, main question will be meant to, to those most aspirant Eastern Partnership countries, Moldova, uh, Ukraine, and now Georgia is, you know, in internal you know, divisions that are also raising a lot of questions uh, in, in our part of the world. Uh, and the most important question that hands in the air, and Baltic countries have been very vocal on that, um, is the, um, the NATO action plan for Ukraine to become a NATO member state. We're not, we're not just talking about already having a plan and let's vote on it. But let's start to develop it. We're not even talking at that stage where we start to actually bring together 
uh, uh, minds and professionals to actually draft where it's heading, uh, in what terms, and so on. And I think this is a, a very huge deterrent for Ukraine when it comes to Russia's ongoing aggression. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted uh, to remind uh, everybody who's participating in this discussion that we already had uh, 30 minutes of intensive exchange of view, views, and there are 30 minutes uh, remaining. So if you have uh, any questions, then now it would be time to ask to raise your hands and uh, to join the discussion with your contribution. And then we also take some questions which are coming in uh, via internet, uh, Slido.com uh, platform. At the present moment, oh yeah, here is a question, please. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Vestros Berzinch, and I'm from the Stratcom Center of Excellence. And I just wanted to ask, uh, as we all know, Estonia has quite a strong connection to the Nordic states and to Northern Europe. So I wanted to see uh, what is the overall Baltic uh, opinion. Should we focus on a stronger Baltic identity, or should we more focus on the uh, Baltic Nordic aid connection in the future? Thank you. So you mostly want to know the view of Mr. Mikkelson on that, yeah? I was actually addressing the whole panel. The whole panel. Answer. Okay, yeah. Richard is already yeah, answering. Yeah. The... Because I have a yeah. quick answer. Just on Monday, we're traveling to Helsinki uh, for the Nordic Baltic uh, Chairs of the Foreign Affairs uh, regular meeting. Uh, so that means the NBA is important format for the cooperation when it comes to the Baltic Sea. Um, we have a lot of, uh, um, uh, you know, on, on, on a values-based approach, uh, I don't think there is a, any divisions. It's just on the specific topics. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, over there, we are actually bringing this uh, dimension when let's have a frank, open discussion. Because, you know, getting together and just agreeing on everything, uh, and, you know, it was nice to see you, see you next year, see you next year. It's, it's not the added value that we want to get from the Nordic Baltic, particularly foreign affairs uh, chairs uh, meetings. So therefore, uh, also provocative conversations among friends are needed in order to bring out uh, truths and also the real stance on the certain issues. For example, uh, we know that uh, Nordic countries are really passionate when it comes to migration. Uh, human rights dimension is really there, and that is something where, you know, I, re I recall 2014-15, when we received, uh, at least Latvia received, some, you know, controversial kind of uh, remarks when, you know, are you, uh, uh, you know, a Nordic country, you're willing, but in the same time, you're not kind of appealing to the same values and so on. And again, you cannot just uh, put in a black and white uh, framework uh, on any topic because, you know, when I speak to my Nordic colleagues and, you know, they bring up the, the migration, particularly right now, it will be a very interesting meeting in Helsinki uh, talking about migration that is, we are experiencing on, uh, on our borders with Belarus. Um, in, the, in the meantime, so you, you well, we, we share the same values. Why, why are you not having the same position as we have? You explained it, but then well, you, you should do the same. And then you ask the question, well, I agree that in a majority of questions, we are like-minded countries uh, on so many you know, fronts. But there will be the, uh, different views. Like, for example, I said, what is your position on Nord Stream 2? Where is your solidarity with the Baltic countries when it comes to Nord Stream, Nord Stream 2? Silence. That you see, it's, it's not about branding. I mean, it's nice to brand, you know, the, the Nordic uh, Baltic Aid. It's a nice cooperation, but we have to, at least when we meet within this brand, to talk openly and directly on the issues and also the differences that we have. And, and, and I think the Nordic Baltic is important uh, format. And, you know, I see um, Baltic countries actually the interconnector. Uh, we, we like to talk about bridges, building bridges. And for a long time, Latvia and the Baltic countries were saying, you know, we're the bridge from the West to Russia. Well, that bridge, you know, the bridge is the most unstable structure in architecture, actually. So <laughs> uh, 
I think what we can do, really, and, and I know there's a huge divisions, and what we, we, we strive for is united EU on the issues, to bring North connected to the South. And this comes back to your previous question on the 16 plus one or whatever number you name it. I think we should focus on the three Cs, and Baltic countries can be interconnected, also bringing the Nordic countries, and connect the historical need for the access north-south, which is not existent to this day. And we can see that from the political discussions at the Euro Council, at the parliamentarians level, at the government's level. We can see that there is a huge divisions when it comes to Central Europe and Nordic Europe. Yeah. Uh, if, I, if I may, this is ex a very good question, actually. And that, and that reminds us that, uh, that our neighborhood is so fascinating, actually. It's uh, the one way we have Russia that keeps us always awake and uh, in, uh, not allowing us to be lazy and pushes us to cooperate, uh, free of us. Uh, but at the same time, uh, from Finland to Iceland, from Norway to Denmark, and Sweden in between, so it's, we have a kind of huge, uh, the, the kind of the, the uh, area for uh, for us to, to to see the benchmarks where we would like to kind of develop our own societies, but also at the same time, there is a kind of very good trade partners, very good uh, partners in terms of understanding world. Uh, in a very similar way. I was at the very beginning of launching uh, cooperation on NB8 level already nearly 20 years ago. Can you imagine, we, uh, for NB8 meeting, uh, Chairs of Foreign Relations Committee started in 2003, just one year prior our membership in, uh, in EU and NATO. And uh, as we know, NB8 is uh, not all are members of EU, not all are members of NATO, but we get together every year twice so next Monday we will uh, cover again, uh, get together again in uh, Helsinki. And actually last night we, we discussed about that because Rihas will lead uh, next year's, uh, first half of next year's Latvian presidency in our format. And actually we, we, we are planning to, uh, to propose uh, uh, next right. week to, for a, a joint visit to Ukraine, actually, to, to, to combine our, the, the previous question you asked about Ukraine. It, it's, it's also, when we, sometimes we discuss uh, with our friends uh, from Nordic countries uh, those very critical existential questions about our security, like Russia, Belarus, Ukraine. Sometimes I understand that people have not traveled to places like even to Kiev or not to even to talk about the uh, front line in the East. And we, this is very, very important for politicians. When we talk about something, we, we first and foremost understand what we talk about. Yeah, and it's really interesting what you mentioned about Ukraine, but also about uh, potential cooperation. Uh, I think that for politicians, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, sometimes it's easier to agree on new priorities because it's like we are preparing for the next round of, of, of our work. But it's very, very difficult to keep up old priorities, which not are difficult because of different uh, political interests or coalitions, but it's just because those new issues are piling up and, and covering the previous agenda. And that's what you mentioned, that you are going to have the next meeting and, and you will discuss Ukraine, and Ukraine will be part of your agenda, at least for, for, for the next round. It's very relevant because some countries in the EU already lost interest. Mm. Yeah? So therefore, this role of such coalitions as the Baltic states mm. is the relevance of sustaining very relevant agenda, which is actually not so much relevant for uh, our countries as for Europe and international security Absolutely. at large. So, yeah, Mr. Bogdanis. Yeah. Just uh, trying to connect uh, those two questions because, you know, to ask the Lithuanian question about identity is quite a difficult uh, question. And I was just thinking, listening to you, Baltics, of course, Nordic Baltics. Honestly, in previous incarnation I was diplomat. Uh, you will not find a better club that cooperates international in different capitals like Nordic Baltics. That's the most active club, simply. We consult in Washington, Brussels, before each meeting. But at the same time, Baltics and Central Europeans, well, 
or Free Seas, you name it, or Baltics and Berlin. Look to our position to Germany and compare to, sorry, to some other Central European countries, or Baltics and UK. My God, our cooperation is the best. We really work all politics and America. We see General Ben Hodges there. You know, we are Chicago, Lithuanians. One fourth of my nation is in Chicago. So for me, actually, it's a very difficult question. And you know how I would summarize it? Baltics are deeply, mostly pro-freedom and pro-democracy. We are the frontier freedom. So that's why we have very good connections to those capitals who defend the freedom. We try to inspire the change. We are looking to our friend uh, Karamurza. We are fighting for uh, democratic and European Russia. And we might be the only, you know, last nations in Europe that will believe in that dream. That we will, we cannot abandon Russian nation to those KGB thieves and killers who are now stealing the future from Russian nation. And we have this, so we will fight for Russian, European, and democratic future. So we are mostly connected to freedom and democracy. And you know, even looking back to the, okay, Lithuanian history, my nation was killed by the end of 18th century because together with some other brothers and sisters, we approved the first written constitution after Americans who were, was quite liberal and democratic, to be honest. And we were killed by free autocratic nations just because we already, by the end of 18th century, wanted to incarnate this democracy experiment into European body. And we've been killed. And when I see my general Kostyushko standing in front of White House, who defended American independence, I know that I was standing on this, uh, those barricades of freedoms with Americans from 18th century. And that's actually the same fight that continues. Thank you. Now we could take another round of questions if there are uh, in the audience. Uh, if not, then I will switch to the one, oh, here? Oh, sorry, Veiko, please. My light, lights are just <laughs> hitting my eye. Veiko's police representing both Estonia and Latvia. Um, leaving all what was said and, and quite eloquently, um, uh, coming back closer to home, because as uh, Zhigis was saying that uh, we should also look a bit into the midterm forward uh, from today. So um, it's very good, the NB8 format, it's very good going together to Paris, Helsinki, uh, but my, I have a two questions. So Estonia is now observer in Arctic Council. Have you been, or whatever the format is, but you are aspiring or looking for these opportunities. So maybe Marco, you can enlighten on that. And have you also coordinated it with Vildis and Riga and whether yes, Latvia and Lithuania has ideas about this? And the second question is more of the economic front. Um, Rail Baltica is being built now, being delayed for at least three, five years. However, we have also Air Baltic, and there have been discussions how to make the company sustainable, perhaps Lithuanian and Estonian governments taking part into the stock. How do you see that? And the second thing, for example, Tiling is a private company, but also if we speak about sustainability, perhaps three countries taking more these matters into the hands and, and helping each other out in this front as well. Thank you. Oh, please, Mr. Mikkelson. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very, uh, very relevant questions, obviously. About Arctic Council, Estonia uh, uh, is in, uh, in a list of first countries, uh, not alone, uh, who would like to become uh, observer uh, member of, uh, of the Council. Uh, we have not made yet into, uh, with obvious reasons, uh, uh, because Arctic Council is uh, the council of eight nations, uh, and uh, uh, Arctic nations, and uh, to, in order to um, make it happen, all eight, including Russian Federation, must say yes uh, for uh, this application. Uh, but we are close. We, we work very close to uh, uh, on on the, these topics, and this is not uh, these are not political ones, as you know. Arctic Council dealing mainly about. Uh, 
ecologic questions, uh, the protection of, uh, of those uh, people living beyond the uh, Arctic Circle, but also this is very important for our scientists uh, who uh, cooperate internationally uh, with uh, colleagues uh, and, uh, at the time, which is extremely important, our time of uh, climate change. We have to uh, really uh, share the knowledge and. Uh, and get more innovative in a way. So it's our approach is there, and uh, obviously we we coordinating with our friends as well. Uh, but on uh, on those uh, very strategic uh, sort of investments we commonly do, uh, like Rail Baltic, uh, like uh, connectivity in general. Obviously, our, our location here for Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania is something where we have to pay attention. How do we connect us in better way? Uh, through with our allies and partners in Europe, uh, through uh, with land connection, and uh, also yes, it's what Air Baltic has done. Great job, actually. It's uh, something what uh, we have to commonly uh, consider quite seriously. It's not so easy, I must say. In early August, uh, Gigimantas invited us to to go to uh, Lithuanian and Belarusian border, and I, I'll tell you, uh, you know, it was. Well, it's a quite a challenge to get to Vilnius. At the end of the day, I drove myself from Thailand to, uh, to, to Vilnius. So we, ha we don't have regular direct flights. And obviously, if Rail Baltic will come, it makes it much easier for us even to connect with. But uh, yes, it's, uh, it comes, it, 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 it's sort of political, tactical sort of approach can be seen here. There can be, you know, they you know perfectly well what our sort of uh, deficiency here in Latvia or in Lithuania or in La uh, Estonia in this regard, but generally strategic view is clear. We have to make it. There is no alternative. And uh, that's the most important understanding in each of our capitals. Mm -hmm. Yes, please, Mr. Well, Gold. I understand what, from Veiko the, the question, what is the Latvia's stance and Lithuania's when it comes to Estonia's aspiration to become the observer at the uh, Arctic Council, we do support. Um, we have uh, we have had the, the internal discussions actually for Latvia itself to to become at some point, um, but I think what is also relevant the uh, the attempts for the EU to be an observer as institution mm -hmm. and into Arctic Council. I think that is something where the, the all EU member states should mm -hmm. work together and actually address that uh, because we we see that the uh, Arctic uh, Council is as you know, uh, Marco mentioned environment issues and scientific, but we all know it has the military dimension as well to it. Uh, we know it's the strategic shipway as well, knowing the, with, the, with the climate change, the, the, uh, the uh, seaways are opening up and then, then there is a potential. Uh, we see that China just recently declared itself as a near Arctic country which is, you know, if you look at the map, where is China and where is Arctic? Uh, somebody can question these, uh, these aspirations, but of course we understand uh, what, what, you know, is behind those aspirations. And for us, if we talk about Rail Baltic, uh, Marco answered, I mean, it's strategic project for us. It's not just uh, interconnectivity when it comes to uh, passengers. Uh, it has also the uh, mobility dimension to it in a much broader uh, context. Uh, and, and this is something that, of course, we had different uh, speeds uh, at different levels, but I'm pleased to see that, you know, uh, everything is going ahead, at least uh, slightly as diverting from the initial plan, but we are getting there. And, 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 and that is something that really is uh, very much important. And that is also very much connected to the Arctic uh, Council as well. Uh, we do, and I think after finishing the uh, construction of Rail Baltic, uh, there will be discussions between Finland and Estonia, and it's, I know there are still discussions to connect uh, to the Rail Baltic um, um, uh, rail, uh, Railway, uh, and that automatically means it connects also the Arctic. And, and that means, you know, different things and different things. Also, going from this um, uh, PESCO initiative, and in defense fund as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Pavelunas. Uh, just last, uh, you know, idea from my side, to twisting a bit the subject. You know, I'm, for some reasons, I'm always looking to Ben Hodges in the far end of this hall. He's close to the exit, and it makes me nervous. You know, I, I feel better when Americans are sitting closer. So just few words on transatlantic links, you know, because minutes are running. 
you know, I think we have to do everything to use this US administration. That is quite European, to be honest, uh, uh, to strengthen that link as much as we can. First of all, we need it in the Baltics because we are the frontier freedom. So those boots on the grounds, you know, boots of generals or any other, they should be actually permanent here. And I think we can get it during this term and this administration, especially because we are joining those American fights somewhere in Indo-Pacific as well. You know, we were with them in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, we are joining them in new fights. You know, Estonians also doing so well with Latvians in Mali. Lithuanians will also seem uh, ready to join them soon. So we should be at the frontiers of freedom, but we have to strengthen that link as much as we can. And it's only, not only about uh, uh, guns and heavy stuff. It's about economy. I'm so glad to see this trade and uh, technology council restarted again. I, I was a big advocate of TTIP, you know, deep free trade agreement. We would be the best winners of the Baltics of that, you know, of that deal. So, Ben, can you do it? The TTIP? Yes, I'm provoking <laughs> general. <laughs> okay. but, Thank you, Ben. <laughs> but may, may, may I jump in here? G, yeah. you, you just raised a very good question, and the question is about uh, our defense cooperation as well. The one is what we're asking from our allies, and they have done a great, uh, great job. We have EFPs in our, uh, uh, in our countries. We, we do have very good cooperation uh, within NATO, of course, in terms of deterring Russian uh, growing kind of uh, threats on to, 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 to our border. But a, uh, what, what is uh, essential as well, then we ask somebody's help. We have to coordinate better in terms of new procurement when we talk about, for instance, air defense, when we're talking yeah. about some much more serious uh, equipment, what we mm. need, all of us, at mm. the same time, which has to be put together into the same operational route. So it's, this is where I see very positive trends, by the way, lately, and uh, uh, this is something where we, we can even uh, do a bit more efforts together. Uh, as you mentioned, the minutes uh, are running, so we have to a little bit compose uh, and, and, and to make more intensive our discussion on the remaining uh, uh, questions which are uh, piling up here. But uh, there is one issue which hasn't been discussed and we have to approach before answering those questions. What is the situation now with Belarus and uh, uh, orchestrated new type of warfare on our borders? And this is particularly a question to uh, Mr. Kohls and Pavilionis because our countries are facing this challenge most of all. So where do we are right now? Well, the, the whole situation with, with, with Belarus had really spun out of any logical control whatsoever. Uh, for Lukashenko, um, really trying to, to keep his position at any cost, um, that also implies in a very uh, you know, intensified meetings with, with uh, Kremlin as well. Um, over there, of course, we can only speculate what have been reached and what are the conclusions. Uh, we can see that Zapad, uh, the recent military exercises, um, I think that is up for our defense specialists to, to uh, deliver the final analysis, but there, there are already indications that the Russian military footprint has increased in, in Belarus uh, for the permanent uh, intentions. Uh, that means the NATO defense plan that was recently and finally approved for our region again, in some capacity, needs to be reviewed and improved uh, because the, 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 uh, the security threats and challenges somewhat have changed. Uh, and that also implies to um, the uh, stability of Belarus uh, as a state altogether, not looking at the, the regime itself. Uh, the, uh, the, the separate activities that are uh, the, the hybrid threats that are being uh, used in practice by Lukashenko, be it migration, uh, 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 be it uh, uh, also the uh, new endeavors that he's trying to look at, like you know, um, taking down the Reiner flight as well. Um, this means that the, uh, the scenarios is hard to predict what else might come. Uh, the uh, situation with migration, uh, unfortunately, I mean, I, I'm afraid that we have reached stalemate. 
uh, at some point. Um, we see that the EU is very hard to convince the colleagues in the West that this is orchestrated and organized by autocrat regime to, to put a pressure on democratic countries. I mean, this is something that on the European continent, particularly at the EU level, it's, it hasn't happened for the first time. This is something where other, you know, autocracy-leaning countries or uh, autocracies ha have used it and, and are using as well. Uh, so therefore, this is, this is something that urgency calls for the United EU uh, approach, particularly uh, when it comes to external borders and physical uh, buildup of the, the, the border. I know that uh, the Frontex, yes, it has a mechanism that provides financial support, technical support to the member states that have been exposed to overwhelmed, you know, uh, pressure from the migration, but all these incentives are more on, you know, caretaking of those who have already crossed the border and so on, not talking about the physical border. And unfortunately, and this is our miscalculation for years, I guess, and I, and I would not blame us for that. I mean, we, we saw that in 2011, EU imposed sanctions on Lukashenko for, again, you know, oppressing opposition, imprisoning uh, political opposition as well, then re just releasing few of them, and of course, for Lukashenko echoing, you know, uh, uh, the, the very negative uh, remarks in regards to Russia's incursion in, in Crimea. EU is softening the sanctions. We see that, you know, okay, we have a new spring in the relations. And, you know, for Lukashenko, for so long, he has managed to stay in this position when one leg is in Europe, another one is in Russia. But, you know, in, in international relations, that position is the, the most... Uh, threatening one because you are the weakest <laughs> in that moment on the specific parts. So therefore, um, the ongoing uh, pressure on the regime should remain and should be increased uh, through sanctions. Um, I know the, uh, there is still more options to, 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 uh, to do that, uh, particularly targeting right now the state-owned companies that facilitate the tour operators, uh, hotels, and et cetera, that are actually facilitating to the inflow of the migrants, not only from Iraq, but I know uh, Lukashenko is already negotiating visa-free regimes with various countries on the African continent from the Middle East as well. And, and, and this is something where, you know, uh, Baltic countries and Poland, uh, I don't think, but again, that is my assumption. We see that, you know, when it started in, in July, really in, intensified, and Lithuania was taken by surprise, um, that uh, afterwards, having a coordinated approach, which has actually resulted in reducing these numbers, but of course, these, peop these people are entrapped in, in, in Belarus in general. Uh, they're not even allowed to leave uh, Belarus. But we see that the uh, amount of people are actually somewhat going further down south, we see Poland is right now really experiencing daily, what, 800, 900 migrants trying to cross the border. And I do not exclude that actually Lukashenko has no idea, no intention what to do with these people. And, and I think to, to push them with every attempt to get them out of Belarus, and I don't exclude that uh, we can actually end up seeing all these migrants that have been uh, traveling to Minsk in the past three months end up in Ukraine. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Paolo. Yeah, just briefly, may, maybe adding, you know, in the middle of Europe, 30 kilometers from Vilnius, we have a terrorist state uh, supported by Russian leadership. Terrorist state that, you know, is, are, is using every means just to keep the power in and using very inhuman stuff. Uh, it's not only, you know, killing democracy, imprisoning a lot of you know, hundreds of friends of mine, like Pavel Severinets and others, but, you know, using people, shooting with people over the border, building nuclear power plants, if, and if accident happens with Astravets, you know, you know what might happen with our region. So doing everything that sounds so terrorist, you know, hijacking planes and so on. So we have Saddam Hussein in the middle of Europe. And what do we do as Europeans? Just watch, make statements, 
we have a lot of instruments to help Belarusian nation to fight for freedom and get those elections finally happen. You know, we have OSCE, we have different other instruments, and we can say to Russian leadership very clearly, so if you maintain that regime with all the means you have, don't think that we will be blind-eyed to the democracy in your own country. You have stolen elections already in Duma. You have forthcoming elections in 24. Don't think that we will just sit and wait and applaud those things. We will name those illegitimate. Your leadership will be illegitimized like Lukashenko itself. So by maintaining that regime, you are getting the same virus. And sooner or later, you will be isolated from the world. So think twice before you do it. So I think looking to New Berlin, looking to new coalition, looking to Americans who say that democracy and human rights are in the center of foreign policy, we have to fight for free and democratic elections in Belarus and do it as quickly as possible. Because if we are not doing it, Lukashenko is being removed by Putin. You know, he will have another puppet, he will annex the country, and then we will face a very severe consequences, all of us in that region. Thank you, Mr. Mikhail. Yeah, if, remark. if I may, just very shortly, uh, the, at the very beginning of our discussion, we talked about uh, that we badly need a very common, strong common sort of understanding in Europe, uh, how do we deal with China and growing uh, assertiveness of China. But it, what is most important for our free countries uh, here, where we are on the front line of democracy against the auto autocracy. And this is uh, there we have, when we talk about Belarus, when we talk about Ukraine or some other issues, we have to see the big picture. And big picture is that this is Russia, all behind of those uh, 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 critical events we, we see within Belarus or, or uh, on our borders. And this is why we, we really need to talk about Russia. I asked uh, yesterday uh, our foreign minister uh, the next Monday is uh, another meeting of uh, foreign ministers of EU. Uh, do, do you discuss also the last elections of, uh, of Duma? Mm -hmm. And our answer was no. Foreign ministers of European Union, doesn't, don't, they don't pay attention on those me uh, meetings to, uh, to what's happening in, on our borders. How come, I ask? And this is why, uh, when, why the wonder when we, we are reactive on our foreign policy when it comes to the very, very serious existential threat which is posed by Russia. Not by Belarus, but by Russia. Thank you for mentioning Russia. Uh, one of the reasons why I didn't ask any questions about Russia is because we are having the whole session uh, this afternoon and Kramurza is going to moderate and definitely those issues will be touched upon. Uh, but summarizing our session, at least I have a few points to make. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, the language which I heard, it's not only language about Baltic cooperation, it's very much about Baltic European mm. voice. Absolutely. And there is more and more and increasingly vision of the world looked through the prism of the EU and Europe at large which on the one hand could seem that Europe is replacing Baltic interests, however, it's just vice versa. It looks that our interests are more and more are the same as Europeans, whether it comes to Belarus or whether it comes to Russia or Nord Stream, which is mentioned here. So we really are in the same line as Europe and we can teach a lesson uh, what you, Mr. Pavilonis, said with its future perspective. And I think that in the end, it's beneficial to all participants. So thank you very much for your contribution to the discussion of the Riga conference. I wish you good luck, and most probably let's have discussion next year.